Hi everyone. My name's Karen. Hi. <laughs> My name's Karen Sandler, um, and I'm here to talk about bringing more women to free and open source software. So a little bit about ooh, a little bit about me. I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, which is an organization that's the nonprofit home of over 30 free and open source software projects, um, including a lot of projects that you've probably heard of, like Git, Samba, Wine, Inkscape, uh, Sugar Labs, which is the software from one laptop per child, um, Selenium. Uh, PHP my admin I always I can't name them all <laughs> um, and uh, we're also known for being the home of GPL enforcement on the Linux kernel um, I am a lawyer also which sometimes when I admit that I'm a lawyer I feel like I have to hide behind the podium or <laughs> I'll get tomatoes thrown at me but <laughs> but I only do uh, pro bono free legal advice, and I, uh, I'm pro bono counsel to the Free Software Foundation, GNOME, and Question Copyright. Um, I'm involved in the Ada Initiative, which I'll talk a little bit about later, and I'm a mentor. And I'm also a cyborg. Um, I have a heart condition. Uh, I literally have a big heart, and uh, I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. So I have a defibrillator that's implanted in my body and connected to my heart but I can't see the software that is in my own body, which is crazy. And the whole experience of finding that out and doing that research has turned me into an extremely passionate software freedom uh, activist. And I'm gonna be talking about that tomorrow at 11, and I hope you come. These are my, uh, my Twitter handles, and the, uh, uh, it's, o zero, it's a O0 Karen. Zero O, <laughs> um, and Outreachy, which is the program I'm going to talk about, and Conservancy, which is my organization. And I'm telling you those things so that I know that if you're looking at your devices, or your computer, or your phone, it's because you are tweeting about how awesome this talk is. So to get to the topic of uh, women in free and open source software, uh, there are a lot of statistics about uh, women in technology and women in software. Um, in the United States, about 25% of all software developers are women, um, but only about 17 and, and about 17% of students are. This number, these numbers have been going down since the 80s. So it used to be like a third of all software developers were women, and then the number of students graduating uh, with computer science degrees has been coming down. Just in the last two years, it's dropped a percentage point. So it's, uh, it's getting worse and worse. In the field itself, this is a really tough slide to read, so don't worry about reading it. But there's a, um, but Tracy Chu of Pinterest, what she did is she uh, put out a call for people who were inside companies to give her head counts of how many women there were in engineering teams. So we have some data about how many women are at a lot of companies. A lot of, a lot of times when companies release information about the um, number of women and men in their organization, they often give their st statistics for, uh, the, uh, for the company as a whole, which uh, isn't reflective necessarily of what's going on in the engineering departments. So, um, so this list is pretty interesting now, it's somewhat self-reporting because the, the, a lot of the, the people who are interested in providing this information are women at these companies. So some of these companies do a lot better than others. But it's really fascinating. And what you can see, um, if you were able to see it, is that you'd see that on the very top end, the number of women is around 20%. But more commonly, the number of women is at about like 12 to 15%. And for a, in these better comp companies that are probably doing better, and then there are a lot of companies that are much lower than that, and this is just a, a screenshot of the top, um, the top ones. So the situation is actually quite bleak. In free and open source software, however, the situation is even worse. Uh, the studies that have been done and the counts that have been taken show about one to 11% women in free and open source software. And the 11% was from a survey where uh, every single 
organization for women that I know about rallied their, uh, their participants to respond to the study. So I think it's disproportionate. But 11 percent is sort of like the upper number of what you might expect for the number of women in free and open source software. So if you look at it, it's confusing. It's sort of like why are there so many fewer women, it's why are there so few women in tech and in software? And then why is it so much worse with free and open source software? So looking at that, you sort of think of why, why is this happening and why do we need initiatives for women? I'm probably not going to get as much in depth as some other talks can and uh, there's like tons of information out there in part because I think it's not easy to identify one, like what the reason is and I think it's very complex. But there are a few issues that sort of seem like they come up um, a lot and are things that we can kind of point to as reasons that it's likely that women are, are staying away. One of them is that girls are discouraged from a very, very early age. There are amazing studies that show that children as early as 20 months old, so like little toddlers, are getting disparate treatment. So the boys are getting, uh, the boys are getting like math concepts taught to them when they're toddlers and the girls are not. There are studies that show that parents help girls a lot more than they help boys. So for example, uh, there is a study that shows that um, they had toddlers go through an obstacle course. And the girls that went through the obstacle course, uh, or rather, let's start with the boys. The boys went through the obstacle course and the parents kind of watched them go through and cheered them on, statistically. Statistically, overall, the girls, the parents would go in and help the, the girls finish the obstacle course. So they changed the rules and they made the parents stay outside the obstacle course. But then what happened was the parents of the girls stood at the finish line of the obstacle course and before the girls could even cross the finish line, the parents were there reaching out and leaned over and brought those, like lifted those girls out so they never even had the experience of finishing. These things are very subtle. They're, you know, cultural norms that we're reinforcing without even thinking about it. I've been technical my whole life and it never even occurred to me that math and science and computers were not for me. But I have a daughter and I noticed after I read that study that I was helping her a lot. So I stopped. <laughs> she went from saying, uh, and she's not a data set, she's just one person, she's an anecdote. Um, and you know, she's not a study. But uh, within a week, she stopped saying, mommy, mommy, can you help me with this? To saying, don't help me, I want to do it myself. And it was like a real transformation in a week. And it was something I would never have thought of if someone, if I hadn't read that study. And I was already working on these issues and how to bring more women in tech. So these things are deep seated and they're not obvious to us unless they're pointed out. Another reason why we think that women are staying away is that because there are so few women here already, it leads to imposter syndrome. Do people here know, does, who here knows what imposter syndrome is? Can you, so it's, it's like a, a third of people here. Um, imposter syndrome is what it sounds like. It's like you feel like uh, you'll be exposed as being an imposter, as if you, um, you don't belong. You, uh, if you hold yourself out as an expert, you will be discovered as being a fraud. Um, and women, ever, anyone can have this. Some men have imposter syndrome, but generally women experience this far more than men, and especially in the sciences. And I read about this, and, and I thought, oh, thank God, um, because I had felt this way my whole life, right? I give speeches. Here's an example. I am probably the only person in the world who has the software background that I have, who is a lawyer, and who has done all of the research about medical devices and pacemakers that I was telling you about before. Because how many cyborg lawyers can there be? But, but every time I would give the speech about the medical devices and about free and open source software, I would panic. 
And the night before I would give the talk, I would stay up all night reading my paper again, reading all of the supporting research again, wondering if someone was going to ask me a question and find out that I had no idea what I was talking about all along. And then I found out about imposter syndrome, and I read about a woman who was a physicist who I had seen speak at a panel uh, that was moderated by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I was very impressed by her. <laughs> and I read an article where she said she had imposter syndrome. And I couldn't believe it, because she's like a string theory physicist who knows Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. Um, and it really kind of opened, uh, you know, opened my mind about it. So I realized that I should talk about having this too, so that for the women who have, who have this experience, you know it's really not you. But the problem with imposter syndrome is that no matter how unfounded it is, it holds you back. And women, because of this, are much less likely to hold themselves out as experts. They're much less likely to submit talks and to get up on stage. Because if I, if I, if I give a talk to you, you might ask me a question that I don't know. But if I just stay by myself and I don't present anything, then there will be less opportunity to be exposed as the imposter I may be. So it means that we have fewer visible women, because the women who have imposter syndrome will do everything they can to sort of stay out of the light of criticism, which is a real problem, because they're less visible, and then their successes are less celebrated, and uh, people don't know as much what they're doing. So that's a real, a real reason why we think that women need initiatives in tech. And the last one, which I would be remiss not to mention, is that there is a tremendous amount of sexism in tech. And there's a tremendous amount of sexism in free and open source software. When I was uh, in university, I didn't believe it. And I basically did not want to talk about women in technology. I said the only way we can do better at this is by just having the women who are here have to be so awesome that nobody questions whether or not we should be here and more women will come in. And I thought that as I got older, I would see evidence of this and I would see it get better. But instead, I've only seen it get worse. And the experiences that I have seen and experienced personally are crazy. In the last year alone, the last year alone, I can tell you my personal stories. In the last year alone, I went to a conference where somebody not only hit on me at a conference party, but physically touched me like all over my body and said, but she is free and open. What? <laughs> free software, not free anything else. <laughs> uh, I was at another conference where I was the keynote speaker and it was the only, like there was only one keynote speaker and the, you know, and the whole conference. And I, I, I went to the social event and I thought, Oh, I don't see anyone I know right away. No problem. I'll go. I'm, I spoke this morning as the keynote speaker. Everybody here heard me talk. I can go over and talk to anyone. So I went over to this table of men I didn't know who were from the financial industry, and I thought, well, that's, that would be an interesting perspective to find out about. And they would not stop talking about the strip club they went to the night before. They would not stop. Every time, many times, not every time, Many times when I check in at a conference or I turn up at a conference, I'm asked if I'm somebody's wife or girlfriend, if I'm a marketer. Um, the assumption is that you don't belong. And that just tells you over and over and over again that you are not welcome. So because it's so hard for women to get here in the first place, and when they get here, they have such bad experiences, we really need initiatives to help support women when both in coming here and in staying here. So this is sort of a, a long introduction to um, the, the program that we started. Um, our program is called Outreachy. And what we decided to do with that was to not worry about why women weren't coming to free and open source software, but instead to try to address every possible reason we could think of and overcome it. And uh, so this program was started uh, before me in 2006 when I wasn't involved in the GNOME Foundation. Um, and it was uh, started by Hannah Wallach and uh, Chris Ball. And, uh, and they noticed that they had 181 applicants to Google Summer of Code, none of whom were women. Like in 181, zero women. <laughs> um, and so they decided they needed to do something about it. And they started a program 
uh, where they had paid internships, it was very much inspired by Google Summer of Code and structured around it. This program wasn't necessarily, like, the program itself was somewhat successful, but none of the participants in the program actually stuck around. None of them con continued to contribute in free and open source software. And because the program wasn't that successful um, in, in any kind of effective, lasting way, the program was dropped, and they decided not to pursue it anymore. Um, and it was just a one-time thing. But in 2009, the GNOME Foundation realized that their problem of not having any women, they noticed there were only 4% women at uh, the main conference of GNOME Guadec. And, uh, and there, were, uh, there was a, a, a prominent uh, comment that was considered sexist that I won't repeat here. And it kind of galvanized people to sort of want to do something about this problem again. And so Marina Zurihinskaya, who was at GNOME, was sort of asked if she would reinvigorate this program. And in 2010, it was reborn um, as the Outreach Program for Women, and this was the logo, which I love. And, and what Marina did was she sort of took that pragmatic approach of thinking about why are women not coming and how can we sort of like help them along the way instead of spending all of our time trying to figure out why. Instead, why don't we just figure out how? And so she said she had this big... Uh, aha moment where she realized that women have a much harder time getting started at all with free and open source software for whatever reason. Some people, you know, it might be because women are less likely to just jump into a mailing list. It might be because coming onto an IRC network can be off-putting because if you have a female name, you could, you'll get, like, I, I remember the very first time I signed on to IRC is Karen something. I don't remember what I signed on as. Maybe it was the same as my Twitter handle. And Big Steve private messaged me immediately, asking me what I was wearing. <laughs> you know, these are sort of the experiences that happen. Uh, and, and, and women sort of have a harder time figuring out where to get started and, and, and who to ask. And they're, if they have imposter syndrome, they're going to be much less likely to ask someone to help them and expect someone to, you expect anyone in the project to feel like it's their responsibility or job or that they want to help them out. So her aha moment was that women need help getting started. And so the major change that happened when the program was reinvigorated was there was a requirement that people who participate in the program must con make a contribution as part of the application process, but that during the application process, there are, are mentors available who will help you do the initial contribution. So it's great because there's a period of time where we say, come apply to the program, and you, there's a dedicated channel that you can go to, and there are people who are available to ask. We have mentors that are identified who are set to help you out. And this was much more successful. And as GNOME had, had interns, uh, you know, once a year, it was, you know, it, it worked out a lot better. And the women who participated in the program started becoming really active members of the project. So much so that it really started to change the way that, the, uh, that GNOME was looking. The mailing lists had a lot more women who were posting on desktop devel. I don't know if anyone here is a desktop person, but I'm intimidated to post on desktop devel. And I was the executive director of the GNOME Foundation. And all of a sudden, you have women who, have were, who had been interns who now feel confident because they've done a bunch of coding or other work in the community. And they feel like they, it's their community. And it really changes things when you see women making important uh, you know, important comments and decisions about the direction of the program. So this was extremely, uh, it, was, it was a much more successful endeavor than before, and it really seemed like it was going to help solve the problem. So that was super exciting. Uh, and then I, I came to GNOME as executive director during that time, and I just was astounded and amazed by how well the program worked and how much people wanted to help with it. And I sort of looked at Marina and we sort of said, I sort of said, well, why does this only have to be for GNOME? Like, we need this for every free software project. So uh, we did a pilot program and the Twisted Project, which was a member of the Software Freedom Conservancy. So I'm executive director of Conservancy now, but then I was not. Then I was a volunteer. Um, I'd helped found Conservancy when I was a lawyer. And I was sort of just like, you know, kind of casually involved as a volunteer helping it keep going. 
Um, and I, I knew Conservancy, and so I knew they were a good organization. And the Twisted Project had Jessica McKellar, who was an active participant, and she was volunteering to be a mentor for this. And so it seems like the perfect pilot. So we, we did that, and it was a success. So we had one Twisted intern and then a bunch of GNOME interns. And it worked out so well, we expanded the project. And before we knew it, we had a lot of free software projects participating, um, including things like the Linux kernel and Wikipedia and Mozilla and all of these other organizations which don't always participate in every round but have participated in some. And the number of participants is just growing, which is great. In the course of uh, the program's existence, we've had 244 interns that have come through. And that includes the early rounds when we, didn't, we were only um, having interns for GNOME with 41 free software organizations. So this is sort of um, our, I think this is our, no, not our latest flyer, but uh, this is the flyer for the round now. Um, and, then, uh, and then realizing that the program had gotten so big and it served so many organizations, we realized that it, it really didn't make a lot of sense for it to be a GNOME Foundation project anymore since it served a lot more than, the, than just GNOME. So the project moved, uh, in cooperation with GNOME, the project moved to the Software Freedom Conservancy and it rebranded um, as Outreachy for a number of reasons, including that uh, we realized, we learned a lot as we went. And uh, what's cool about the program is that every round that we have, we ask for feedback and every round that we have gets tweaked a little bit and improved. Um, and we realized that we wanted to be more inclusive. So our, our program is now for, uh, for women, cis and trans, for trans men, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, yeah, trans men and gender queer people. And having that explicit inclusion is really important to our program. Also, we want to address other underrepresented groups. And um, for example, if you're a trans man, being in a program that's called Outreach Program for Women just wouldn't work. Um, or if you're gender free, for example, saying that you have to identify as a woman or being a part of outreach program for women might not make sense. But we want to sort of be inclusive for, um, you know, for everyone who is having a really hard time getting started and uh, is completely underrepresented in our field. So this is how uh, our, our program looks now. And we've got our own fan. It's still new, so I'm really excited. It's, uh, so we're outreachy.org. So how we do it is that we address, we address women, um, cis and trans and gender queer directly because one of the things that we realized from the program is that it was so successful because the women who participated in the program, especially uh, women primarily in the beginning, were, were really, uh, you know, intimidated by Google Summer of Code. Not everybody, but some of the women were really intimidated by Summer of Code and felt like it wasn't for them. But seeing that it was an outreach program for women, seeing that the program was specifically for them, made them feel like they could do it. And some of these women that came through uh, the outreach program would never have, um, you know, would never have necessarily looked for a job or looked for an opportunity in free and open source software. Um, and because of that, many of them have done Google Summer of Code after. We also accepted, we accept non-students so it's not simply for, like, Google Summer of Code is only for students, but we recognize that women at all different points in their life have, have times when they, uh, when they may be looking for another opportunity or have times where they're um, having a hard time getting their career jump-started or finding something else to do. Um, and it's, it's something, it's, it's an area where the tech industry really falls down in helping women, right? Like the women that participate in, that, that have tech jobs when they have kids or that's when we lose a lot of women. So this program basically draws women when they're in that stage, which is pretty neat. Um, and it also means that we get women who are much older sometimes and women who are in all stages of life, women who have just had babies, who need a flexible schedule. Um, we uh, connect women with mentors directly so that they, um, they know how to get started and they have someone to ask so that they establish relationships. Um, as I said before, we require contribution as part of the application, which really, really helps in part because everybody who applies to Outreachy emerges in the other end a contributor. So we can't accept everybody. The program is somewhat selective. But, uh, but everyone who applies can say, I contribute to an open source software project and can put it on their resume. And that's pretty neat. 
um, and has been a huge, uh, huge benefit. But on the flip side, it means that we can choose really, like we know a lot about the people who are, who are applying, and we can choose our participants from the strongest applicants. And so in order to make a contribution, you have to get, get set up and ready to, you know, ready to, to go. And so it's, it's less theoretical. You're not looking at someone's resume and saying like, well, she had good grades, but you know, we don't really know. We can't, we're looking at some of her code. It's tough to tell. This time you, you see, you can see what the applicants are doing um, in the position that they'll be in for the internship, which is really um, part of what makes the program so successful. Um, and we, uh, we uh, try really hard to get the word out. During the program, we, um, we make sure that we're focused on having a good experience in free software. Um, and part of that is that we encourage manageable tasks. So Summer of Code is sort of like a big, a lot of times it's like a big proposal with something extremely ambitious uh, and, uh, and can be quite intimidating. And so instead, we sort of take that and, 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 and separate it into little manageable bite-sized tasks and, uh, and then women can sort of like see progress and also it kind of helps to get started. It's less overwhelming. This has a funny effect where uh, I had a marketing intern that I was a mentor for and during the application process, this one, one of the applicants actually completed every single one of the manageable tasks I had set aside for the whole internship <laughs> and had finished them before her internship had even begun. <laughs> so we had to get a lot more manageable tasks. But it's a good way because it, it's sort of like it, it helps people get started and helps them um, continue. Um, we require participants to blog every two weeks um, or more if they want. And we ask projects to incorporate those blogs on planets if they have them. And this is super cool because what happens here is that if you've got a planet and you've got like the avatars of people who are uh, blogging on the planet, all of a sudden you've got faces of women who are doing really interesting work. And it changes the way people think about women contributing to their project because they see these women doing cool stuff and talking about it. Um, and what's also good about it is that if women are working in an area where the reader is interested in, they know who to reach out to. So when they go to conferences, people are familiar with their work and can say, oh, you're the one who worked on that thing. I'm doing something related to that. We should talk. And it makes a complete, uh, a complete difference. Plus it creates a, a, a record for that intern, which is very helpful going forward. Um, we have an IRC channel and meetings, and that's really important um, in part because having a support network for women in this space is huge. Like being able to, when those terrible things happened to me, those sexist experiences happened to me, it was amazing to be able to go to the, like I'm the organizer, right, and a mentor, but I still go to the channel and say, hey, guess what happened to me? And I benefit from the support that the women who are participating in the program can lend to me. And it's sort of a nice, a nice thing that happens. There was one time where I posted a, um, a photo of me on a panel and I'm so established in, like, as a speaker. I'm, I, I've been speaking a long time. I, but the first comment I got on my blog post was nice boobs. And I was like, what? Really? And it just, it just made me want to like turn off and run away. But instead, I went to the channel and I said, oh my gosh, listen to just what happened. And then four other people said, oh my gosh, that just happened to me like yesterday. And, and all of a sudden, you're not alone. And all of a sudden, you feel like you have the, the skills and the camaraderie and the, you know, the support to be able to continue and to carry on. Um, and it, doesn't, it just feels like you can laugh at it. You, know, you can say, like, I mean, it's not funny, but you can, I mean, but you can say, you, know, you can sort of like get a thicker skin because you feel supported. You shouldn't have to have a thicker skin, but it really helps. <laughs> um, and we also have worked in a, like a, a piece of the, the payment is for, um, is for funding to go to a conference. And this is really important because getting people to meet face to face like you guys are here now is essential in getting people to feel like they're connected to the community and that they want to continue to contribute. It also helps people find new opportunities, get jobs, like everything connected to the good things in free and open source software are made better by coming to conferences. And then we try not to stop when the program's over. So we encourage mentors to continue to uh, be in touch with their, um, their former participants. And uh, we encourage them to, the participants to pursue other opportunities like Google Summer of Code. 
um, and uh, hacker, hacker schools and things. Uh, we encourage them to present at conferences because if uh, part of imposter syndrome is, as I said, that you're much less likely to propose a talk um, and hold yourself out there. So I, I only started speaking at conferences because not only did people ask me, but they twisted my arm. <laughs> so there was one time where there was a documentary that was being filmed about software patents and I was basically sort of shying away. And I kept saying, oh, you don't want to talk to me. Why don't you talk to this person and this person and that person? They really know what they're talking about. And, uh, and, and two of those people were people who I worked with in the same office. And so when the film crew came to interview them, the, um, the director of the video, of the, the, the documentary, it's called Patent Absurdity, um, if you want to take a look at it. Uh, the director of the video came into my office and he said, can we talk? And I said, oh, okay, we can talk. He shut the door and he sat down and he said, what is it? Like, I have asked several women who have been recommended by experts in the field as someone who I should interview, and every one of you that I have asked has said no and told, put me off on other people. And no matter how hard I try and ask you to be in my film, you all just push me off. Very good reasons every time, but I don't understand. And, I, and, you know, and he said, I can't have a movie of just white men when I know there are qualified women out there. I just, I don't feel good about it. I'm going to not make this film. Will you, will you be interviewed? <laughs> and so I, I said, okay, just tell me what the questions are in advance. <laughs> and I'll do some research. And, and it was really an eye-opening moment for me because I would never, I would never have done it. I would have run away from it. I would never have wanted to be that pressure. And I'm so glad I'm in that documentary. It's great. And I found that I've only, um, I only started speaking at conferences because people said, you should speak here. And I was so, like, they put it in such a way that I was embarrassed to say no. <laughs> um, and, and now it's a big, it's a big part of, of what I do, and I couldn't imagine not doing it. And I found that, so for with, with Outreachy, the people who come through the program acquire expertise, but it never occurs to them that they can be presenters too. And so by encouraging them to speak at conferences, not only is it good for them and good for their career, but it's good in that you see women who are competent, capable, and part of our community as like visible voices. And on top of that, it changes the tenor of conferences when you see more women there and you see more women on stage. It's a lot better as, a, uh, as an experience as a, as a female attendee. Um, and we also, uh, oh, we also have a, uh, have uh, uh, women that participate in the program uh, stick, stick around and continue to participate to answer questions. And it's amazing. A huge portion of the program now is, uh, is like, just has like a lot of momentum from graduates of the program who stick around and sort of answer questions, especially during the application process. And it's really inspiring because a lot of it kind of runs itself. Um, and most importantly, we bring a value of free and open source software. So there's no guarantee that the participants in our, pro in our program are going to continue to stick around and contribute. They don't have to. It's not like, you don't, we don't, you don't sign a contract in blood for life if you, if you participate in Outreachy. You can go on and do whatever you want to do, even if it's proprietary software. But the people who come through our program understand why software freedom is important and that these kinds of ethical opportunities come from an ideological community. And the fact that the graduates who come through the program, even if they go on to do something else, is extremely valuable um, for free software in general. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have sponsors of the program. <laughs> um, what, uh, what I, I got a little uh, cheeky when I came up with the idea of, uh, of what to name the level. So instead of going with uh, the precious metals, gold and silver and platinum, we went with uh, uh, includers, which is the lowest level, and then promoters, uh, which supports uh, three interns, uh, and then uh, equalizer, which is the next level. And the top level, we have our sponsor for the very first time, Intel sponsored at this level, and I called it the ceiling smasher level which is a little, a little uh, jokey, but, um, but it's so exciting because it, it really starts to help, like being able to sponsor that many interns makes a big difference. And these are our includers. We require the projects, the, the free software projects or organizations, we call them, 
who participate in the program to, uh, to either have the funding themselves for one intern or find funding from one other. So a lot of these uh, listed includer sponsors are the foundations themselves that are participating and some are just, uh, are just sponsors. Uh, Red Hat and GNOME help, help Conservancy run the program and, uh, and it's a, a huge help. GNOME provides infrastructure um, and Red Hat contributes uh, Marina's time which is incredibly valuable. And the results of the program have been really astounding. Um, this is a quote that uh, somebody said, uh, a graduate of the program said about FOSDEM, which is the conference in uh, Brussels that happens every year. It's a huge conference. It's like 5,000 people all packed into a university and over only two days. And it's, it's crazy, but it's very weird because traditionally it's been like, like this conference is actually quite like really, like much better than most of the conferences that I've been to. There have been a lot of women around but at FOSDEM, especially a few years ago, there really, really weren't. And she said, I attended FOSDEM and a couple of guys came to tell me they were surprised to see a girl there. You feel like you're not supposed to be there, like you're doing something wrong. So it was nice to have this space here and feel like I was in the right place. And that really tells me that we're doing something right. Wikipedia, when they first started to participate, before they participated in outreachy, they had only ever, of all of their years past of participating in Google Summer of Code, had one applicant who was a woman. And they went from that to having seven participants in the very next round who were women. The Linux kernel has had an amazing result from participating in Outreachy. So every, like a lot of the kernel releases, they do um, like the kernel stats of who contributes and now Outreachy is always in like the top uh, contributors by company, which is amazing, like higher than a lot of really heavy hitting companies that use Linux commercially. Um, and it, it, we kind of go up and down. There have been around 25 women who have been interns with the Linux kernel since the program, uh, since they started participating in the program, which I don't know the stats from before, but I have to imagine is a massive, massive increase. And these are sort of the accomplishments of alums, which I'm extremely proud of. Of, of the, the, I guess it's like 240 now, um, alums, 31 have become speakers. Um, 25 have actually gone to work directly with uh, sponsors, which is really interesting because companies that are committed to sponsoring and supporting initiatives for women become attractive places often for women to work. Uh, 16 went on to additional programs. Uh, 10 became mentors, which is my favorite statistic, and that I think we're going to see more of that because it takes time for women to become mentors, and it was only in, uh, in 2010 that we re rejuvenated the program, so it's not really that long. But one of the mentors, one of my favorite stories, is that we had a mentor with GNOME who was so successful she became really invested in the project, and she became a mentor. But not only was she a mentor, but the woman who was her mentee who participated in the program became a mentor herself. So the original woman is a grand mentor. Um, very excited about that. Um, and it's, it's cool. There are other women who have been involved as organizers too who aren't mentors. And another thing I'm particularly proud of is that three of the women who participated in the program have organized local tech groups, including the Nairobi Dev School which has been, you know, it's, it's cool. It's basically founding, a new, and the, there's a Women in Free Software India and a Chicago hacking group that was started because of this initiative. So women becoming leaders and founding other opportunities for women to get involved. And one of the former participants is now on the GNOME Board of Directors and is its treasurer. So by participating in this organization, these projects have really transformed, the, you know, they've, they've attracted extremely valuable people and have transformed how they run and who they are. But another good thing about the program is that with these improvements for women and to attract women, we found that they, they're improvements for everyone. They make things better for any kind of newcomer. Having a list of mentors who are available to answer questions at any time, um, you know, who are sort of invested in having newcomers um, is extremely uh, helpful because it means that even if you're not applying to outreachy, you can see, oh, these five people are, peop are listed as being available and wanting to help me out when I get started. And so um, men and women use that list throughout the year to help get started if they want to. Um, because of the program, 
there are tutorials for newcomers. And also, we ask that projects identify really easy, because those manageable tasks, we ask the projects to have, like, identified um, easy bugs that people can start, get started and fix. It's sort of like, I know it's easy to fix that bug, but don't do it. <laughs> Leave it and let somebody who's starting out do it, because, you know, they'll be able to do it. It's something that will take you five minutes. It's going to take them five days. But when they're finished with that, they'll know all about how to contribute to the project, and it'll be fantastic. Um, and that's good for everyone, um, even not for people participating in the program. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the blogging is, is good for everyone because we all benefit from seeing what's going on in the project. Um, and the Google Summer of Code um, participation has improved for all of the participants in Outreachy because almost all of them have taken the methodologies that we've introduced with Outreachy and have incorporated it into Google Summer of Code, which means that Google Summer of Code has improved. And our conference presence has totally changed. The Linux kernel now always has a panel of women talking about their work. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Um, and uh, just seeing women who are visible changes the way you think about the project. Um, so talking about changing GSOC, the number of women in GSOC has steadily increased since we founded the program. Um, but uh, <coughs> I haven't, excuse me, <coughs> I haven't uh, gotten the stats for this year yet. Um, there are at least two winners this year for the, um, the Google Code-In, which is the Google uh, contest for high school students. Uh, but uh, there's still a ways to go with, uh, with getting girls involved in uh, the coding and giving them the right mentorship so that they can become grand finalists. Uh, I would be very remiss if I didn't mention that what we do is one piece of the effort to bring more women into free and open source software and underrepresented groups generally. And these other organizations are extremely helpful. The Ada Initiative um, does uh, a lot of really cool things with like anti-harassment policies and having allies workshops. And Open Hatch is an amazing organization. Uh, Deb Nicholson is here. Uh, if you have questions about that, who uh, and they have like open source comes to campus and um, and all these great um, initiatives to get uh, people started with newcomer um, tutorials and things like that. There are organizations like Women Who Code and Chick Tech, uh, and each of these organizations fills a different niche, and we need that. People sometimes sort of pit these organizations against each other and are sort of like, well, I don't understand. Why do we need all these organizations? Or I, I, I prefer this one over that one. But each of these organizations performs a different, uh, a different piece of the puzzle, right? Like, Outreach Program for Women helps bring women here. But if they come here and they go to a conference and they have a terrible experience, they're never going to stick around. Like, you know, so the Ada Initiative helps with codes of conduct and uh, making sure that conferences are safe places. And so each of these things work together, and we need all these different organizations. So the key lessons learned from having the program that I try to keep in mind whenever I, I think about Outreachy or trying to bring women into free and open source software generally is that it really helped that we invited women and other underrepresented groups explicitly, that we specifically said this is a program for women so that women knew they could apply. Changing our language so that we said, explicitly said gender free and gender fluid meant that people knew they, the program was for them and it means that they applied and it also meant that they knew that free and open source software was for them. Showing men that they can help, uh, men are often sort of say, well, that talk isn't for me because it's about bringing women to free software and I'm not a woman. But we have so few women here that if we relied on only women to bring women, <laughs> we would never succeed. Um, so showing men that they can help and giving them ways that, concrete ways, uh, so most of our, almost all of our mentors in the program are men, and that's extremely helpful. Um, helping to con provide connections early so that when people are interested in coming into free and open source software, they know what to do and who to talk to. And, uh, and that having that mentors list is extremely helpful for everyone. And also creating support groups so that people don't feel like they're alone. So the, um, the next round that we're going to have, I have all these, um, I have some of these flyers there. Um, so if you want one, there's, I put a little stack at the front of the stage where you can come ask me for them. These are flyers, if you know, um, this is for the next round, which has a deadline in October. And the earlier you start, the better. If you're an organization, with a, if you're with a free software project, it's a perfect time to consider joining for the next program. If you uh, work at a company, it's the perfect time to consider sponsorship. Um, and uh, if you happen to know a talented woman who has a, uh, 
uh, an opportunity. So um, uh, has a, a you know is looking for an opportunity. We we do two rounds with Outreachy because we recognize that here in the Southern Hemisphere, your summer is at a different time than our summer. <laughs> and you might have time at a different time of the year. So, uh, so we do two rounds, unlike Summer of Code. So we do one that starts in, uh, in December and one that starts in May. And uh, we've been a little bit flexible around the school schedules for students um, as well. So it's a little, the timing is a, a little, uh, so it's, it's actually perfect for here because uh, if you get started now, you'll be set for the, uh, for the, uh, the next summer. Um, and we're contemplating how to address this issue about girls and free and open source software. Um, and we're sort of thinking maybe we should start an outreach program for girls to, to go along with the code in. We're also wondering about how to address the, the issue of, um, of people of color in free and open source software. Um, these are US based statistics because um, that's what we have access to. But there are over 9% black computer science graduates in the United States and at every single US based free software conference you can basically count the black people on one hand it's like the disparity there is completely disproportionate to the people who are graduating from computer science so um, and and it's not the only group of underrepresented people and because we've been so successful helping to bring women into the program we're sort of exploring how we can expand to other groups so you can help us. Um, you, can, uh, you can apply to, I encourage you to apply if you're looking for an opportunity. You can make a donation. We accept individual donations. Um, amplify voices of women. Uh, women are statistically overlooked. For some way, like studies show that if you're, that, that, that when women speak, people just pay less attention. I, when I have meetings, I actually pre-discuss my best ideas in advance with more than one person so that when the time comes for the meeting, they hear it. Because what happens if I don't is that I'll say my idea, and then someone will, and then like no one will say anything. And five minutes later, some guy will say it, and everyone will be like, what a great idea. Fantastic. But if I pre-discuss that idea with other people, then those people will say, oh, wait, but Karen had that idea. And, and this is the kind of thing we don't realize we're doing it, but we are. We are not putting the same attention to things women say um, as we are to men. So encourage women to participate. Um, consider, consider them as speakers. Encourage them. Nominate them for, them for awards. It's really important. Um, the Conservancy and Outreach uh, as part of it is a charity. Um, so uh, we really appreciate donations. Uh, and uh, this talk is uh, under CC by SA, so you can share it with anyone. And I encourage you to, you can give your own presentations about the program. Um, so if you can, make a donation. And I've, we've, I'm totally available for questions. Do we have time for questions? A few minutes for questions. Just one or two. Who has a question? OK, there are a couple over there. Five minutes for questions. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I just would like to, to make a comment that uh, it can bring a, a little bit of brainstorm, but a good brainstorm. Uh, for me, uh, the, the thing about women working with technology, uh, it was something like, uh, you know, uh, about predisposition. I, I've always felt like that, you know. Men has a predisposition for that, and women doesn't have, you know. But just genetically speaking, but uh, you're bringing very valuable numbers, and for me, I, I totally changed my mind about it. Really, you know, it's uh, it is fantastic to see that uh, the, the women are, you know, uh, very involved with technology, developing and working in sysadmins. I'm seeing so much of this, even in my uh, work, and I would like to to thank you to about bringing these numbers to us. Okay, thank you. Thanks. There's a question from a woman, I think, in the front. Hello. I'm Georgia, again. And first, I, I want to say that what he, he's talking about, I am listening since I choose this area. 
Oh, but you know, women are not really good in math and all these things, or you don't know how to use a computer properly, or something like this. And I would say that uh, the child, when when we are child, the beginning is everything that you you said. Oh, you cannot have a car as a toy. Oh, you cannot go out to the street and play with the guy, the other guys, or you cannot do this, you cannot do that. You should be a good girl and stay at home with your dolls. And that sucks. <laughs> so It's very frustrating. Yes, it's totally. I was six and I was saying, why I cannot have a small car or something like a engineer things like Lego and these things. Oh, you should play with a baby doll. No, I hate this, you know? <laughs> There's uh, a song uh, by this uh, singer, um, uh, what's her name, Seeger. Um, what's her first name? Patty, Patty Seeger? Um, a Peggy Seeger, who called I'm, I'm Gonna Be an Engineer. Um, I recommend you listen to it, and it's it's basically, the song is basically about this. But uh, I've experienced this in my own life. My parents were very, my father was very supportive, but, uh, and he did, we did tons of science together, and then I found out last year he told me that uh, he just said offhand, yeah, but men are much better at science and math than women. I said, what? But what about me? And he's like, well, you're a person, you're not a data set. Like, <laughs> women just in general are worse at it. But I started showing him the studies, And now he's a scientist, so he has concluded that, in fact, he doesn't know. And I think bringing this information to people and letting them see it for themselves and see how biased we are, and especially the studies about what we're doing to, you know, with, with young girls and not even giving them the opportunity to learn problem solving and build those skills, is crazy. The general rule of thumb is that if a woman is here, is in math and science, there's a very high probability she is really good because it is so hard to get to the point where you will be here. Um, and it's, it's funny. And my question, my oh, real sorry. question, will be uh, could, could we Brazilians apply for the... For the yeah, it's an international program. You work remotely, um, uh, so it's totally flexible. We've had uh, Brazilian uh, participants in the program. In fact, the, one of the, I'm out of time, but I'll just say that one of the, uh, the earliest uh, uh, rounds, one of the early rounds we had, we had one participant at least from each habitable continent. So it's a cool program. Anyway, I'll be here. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much for attending.